Good morning. There's a lot of you. Okay, so today I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 26, verses 69 through 75. And in these scriptures, we will be talking about when Peter disowned Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. And it says, Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before all of them. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath, I don't know that man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Good morning, church. It is great to be up here. It's great to be here. Um, this is definitely home now. So thank you for bringing us here. I'm not quite sure where to leave my watch. Oh, there's a spot under there. There we go. Um, I just want to do a, a quick shout out. Terry may be at home watching on the streaming. If so, Terry, we love you very much. And we're all praying for you and your speedy recovery. So I have chosen an interesting topic today. At least I think it's interesting. You may be looking in the bulletin and see my name in failure. That's probably accurate. Um, but this is a topic that I'm very interested in. Um, it's something that our society talks a lot about, this idea of success and failure. And our society teaches us that it's two separate paths, that you're going down one, the path to success, or you're going down the other, the path to failure. We can't walk down both simultaneously. It's one or the other. And the fact of life is this. At some point, each and every single one of us is going to face failure. And what I want to talk about today is how do we deal with failure when we encounter it? How do we deal with it when we encounter physical failure? How do we deal with it when we encounter emotional failure? And most importantly, how do we deal with it when we encounter spiritual failure? And some of the hints in here aren't just for us, but maybe how we can help others through failure in their own life. So, I feel to set the mood for this, we have to share a few fail stories. So we'll see if I got my clicker going the right direction. There we go. The first person I want to tell you about is a man who didn't speak until he was four years old. He didn't learn how to read until he was seven. Uh, his parents described him as mentally slow. Um, or mentally handicapped even, was how his parents described him. His teachers in school described him as unsociable, adrift forever in his own foolish dreams. He eventually did make it into university, only to be expelled. He tried to get back into the same university, and they just denied him admittance. They didn't want him as a student. He did eventually make it into a doctorate program where he wrote a dissertation, and the dissertation was rejected under the terms that it was irrelevant and fanciful. And some of you may know who we're talking about, but we are talking about Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein went on from there. He won a Nobel Prize. He's pretty much the face of modern physics when it comes down to it. We can look at the life of Albert Einstein, and if we were to only look at the early years of his life, we would probably say that he was firmly on the path of failure and that there wasn't much that he was going to do with his life. But we saw, through hindsight really, that he went on to succeed in so much more. He moved on from his failures and did more. All right, one more. The second one I want to talk about, this is a man who actually ended up playing in the NBA. He was cut from his high school basketball team, and here are some of his statistics from his professional career. He missed more than 9,000 shots. He lost 300 games, and 26 times he was the guy that that last-minute shot that could win the game, they entrusted it to him, and he missed and lost for them. Now, some of you may recognize who this is by the statistics, and that is Michael Jordan arguably one of the best basketball players of all time, if not the best basketball player of all time. 
An amazing, amazing career. But what's interesting is these statistics actually come from him. These are things that he remembers. And here's a quote from him. He said, I have missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I have lost almost 300 games. On 26 occasions, I have been entrusted to take the game-winning shot, and I missed. I have failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. We can look at people like Einstein. We can look at people like Michael Jordan, and we can see that they are more than their failures. We can see that they have gone on to succeed. And it's easy when you have hindsight to be able to have that kind of vision when it comes to failure. But most of us, when we encounter failure in that moment, it can seem something that is insurmountable, something that we cannot move past, something that we are stuck on. And Peter knew exactly what that felt like. And that's the passage that Chris just read out of Matthew 26, verses 69 through 75. I want to bring your attention back there. This is after Jesus has been arrested. He is basically standing trial at this point, but it's before he's been crucified, and Peter wants to know what is going to happen to Jesus, and he's hanging around in this courtyard, and that's where our story unfolds. It says in verse 69, Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a serving girl came to him. You were also with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before all of them. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then they went out, then he went out to the gateway, where another serving girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. And he denied it again with an oath. I do not know this man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I do not know the man. Immediately, a cock crowed. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside, and he wept bitterly. Here's a man who knows what it's like to be consumed by failure. Here's a man who can't see hope past the failure of the situation he's in. The only response that he can think to do at this point is to walk away and to cry. But this isn't the end of the story of Peter. Peter goes on to do so much more after this. And we have the beauty of hindsight to be able to recognize that Peter was more than that moment. He goes on from there and he preaches on the day of Pentecost. And in Acts chapter 2, it says that his words cut people to their hearts. And 3,000 people gave their life to Christ that day because of the words that he spoke. He goes on from there and he writes... First and second Peter, and a lot of people believe that he helped Mark to write his gospel as well. We can look at the life of Peter and know that he was anything but a failure. But in that moment, he knew what it was like and how we feel when we fail. To have no hope, to see that there's no point forward from here. And that really brings us to our first point that I think we need to understand. Our failures do not define us. They don't define us. We can fail and still succeed. It isn't two paths that are diverging and you can only go down one, the path to success or the path to failure. They are not mutually exclusive. We can fail while we're on the path to success. So why is it that we believe this idea that our failures can define us? Why is it that we buy into that concept? I think the reason for me is because we don't hear the truth about who we are. We don't understand or hear the truth that God is speaking into our lives. We don't have people telling us how God sees us and who we are. And that's our next point. We need to tell people who they are. This is what Jesus did throughout the scriptures. He was a big fan of telling people who they are. Jesus did it with Peter a lot. Jesus, in fact, does it with him 
um, right before he denies him, right before he fails in such a big way that he's brought to tears. And it's found in Luke chapter 2 in verse 31 through 32. It says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. Oh, I don't have that one on there. Um, Yes, Peter failed. Yes, he denied Jesus. He tells him that in the very statement about it. But he also tells him that you're going to go on to be more than your failure. You are going to go on and you are going to be a source of strength and encouragement to your brothers. He is more than his failures. Another one of my favorite ones is the Samaritan woman. When Jesus encounters her in John chapter 4, he has this awesome conversation with her. We know from the time of day that he meets this woman, she's out in the middle of the day drawing water, and we know that she's by herself and not with anybody, and based on those circumstances, we know before Jesus ever even talks with her that she's an outcast of society. And Jesus sits down with her, and he has a conversation with her, and it goes like this, starting in verse 16. He told her, go and call your husband and come back. And she said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands. The man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. And her response is one of my favorites because it's very understated. I don't, it's very mild. I don't think I would react this way if I had this kind of encounter with Jesus. But uh, in verse 19, she says, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our response would be totally different if somebody came up to us and told us everything about our life, things that they had no business knowing. We would be asking, okay, how long have you been following me? Are you stalking me? Um, Where are the hidden cameras? Who have you been talking to? It would not be, you are a prophet. Jesus continues in a conversation with her from there. And they talk about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And at the end of that conversation, when she walks away, her response is really interesting. And if you skip down to verse 28, you can read it there. Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town, and she said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I've done. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of town and made their way towards him. This woman had an amazing conversation with Jesus. And she didn't walk away from that conversation and go and find the man she was living with and say, you know what, I met a man today who straightened me out on you and me living together. It's over. That's not the response she had walking away from a conversation with Jesus. She left there and she told everybody she knew, I met a man who told me who I was. And I want you to come meet him as well. What would it be like if we had these kinds of conversations with people? That if when we met somebody, we told them who they were, their reaction would be they would walk away and just like this woman, their response would be, you know what? I met heaven. I met somebody who told me who I am. That would be beautiful That would be powerful. I want to be that kind of person that when people have a conversation with me, they walk away and they know what God is like. Let me illustrate this for you a little bit more, the concept that I'm talking about. How many of you know anything about Trinidad, Tobago? Any of you ever been there? A couple of you know some stuff about Trinidad. I've never been there. I've met three people from Trinidad, really. His name is Dominic Dos Santos. He's a preacher there. And his wife, Anne, Annie, and their son, Paul. And they are some of the most amazing people I have ever met. They are loving, they are Christ-like, they're fun to be with, they enjoy food, they enjoy laughter, they enjoy company. And you know what? If everybody in Trinidad was like Dominic and his family, I would move there in a heartbeat. Because who wouldn't want to be surrounded by people like that? If we're the kind of people that we're called to be as Christians, We're supposed to be a reflection of God. We are called ambassadors. 
That means that when people encounter us, they should be encountering a reflection of God. People should walk away from us saying, I know who God thinks I am. But I want to take this a step further. I don't think Jesus stopped at telling people who they were. I think he also told people who they were becoming. And I think that's what we need to do with people as well. We need to tell people who they are becoming. We can look back and see an example of this with Jesus and Peter once again. If you look in John chapter 1 in verse 42, Jesus has a conversation with him. And the first time he meets Peter, he's talking to him. This is before he's called to be a disciple or any of those things. In fact, at this point, his name is Simon. And this is the conversation that Jesus has with him. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John, and you will be called Cephas, or Caiaphas, which we translate as Peter. But if you go back and you translate this word, Cephas, when you literally translate it, it is rock. So Jesus encounters Simon, and he tells him, guess what? Your new name is Rock. That would be like me renaming maybe uh, Wayne and deciding, hey, Wayne, guess what? Your new name? It's now Rock. Rock on, Wayne. <laughs> but the thing is, God does this throughout the Bible. He changes people's name with a purpose. We see it with Abraham. We see it with Sarah. We see it with Israel. God is constantly telling people who they are becoming. And let's be honest, Peter, at this point, Simon, he's anything but a rock. Um, I would describe him more of all of his interactions with Jesus is open mouth, insert foot. That's kind of how a lot of his conversations go. He is a man who jumps to action quickly. And a lot of times, it wasn't even the right action. He just kind of goes for it. Um, he, at one point, even cuts off a guy's ear. Like, that's how brash he is. That's how quick he is to act. He's just this emotional bundle of energy that's just jumping from thing to thing. But if you look at the later life of Peter, he is a rock. He's pretty much the face of the New Testament church. He becomes extremely consistent and stable. And Jesus saw who he was becoming in the very first encounter he had with him. And he tells Peter, you are a rock. You're not just Simon, the son of John, but you are a rock. The scriptures put it this way in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The person you are becoming is not the person you are today. God knows both of those people. And God is not going to stop what he's doing in you. He will bring it to completion. He will not leave you as you are. He will change you and turn you in to someone new. We have this habit when we look at our successes, when we look at our failures, that we see ourself and we think it's our story. But the truth of the matter is, our successes and our failures are not our story. They are God's story. We are God's story. All of our failures, they're a part of God's story. All of our successes, they are a part of God's story as well. I, I came across an article about a man who wrote a book, but he didn't want to print it on paper. It's a book of about 60,000 words. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to get one word tattooed onto 60,000 people so that his book would be a living book. And then when you line up these people, they could read each of their words and it would tell his story. Now, I don't know about you. I would be really disappointed if I signed up for this and I got the letter A. Talk about a really uncool tattoo. But there is something here for us in this story and in this illustration. We are a living representation of God's story. We're a continuation of that story that we read in the scriptures. God has written a part of his story on each and every single one of us. Some of those stories are stories of failure. Some of those stories are stories of success. 
But the entirety of that story can only be told when we come together as the body of Christ and we live in such a way that our successes are given to God as his successes, when our failures are seen as God's strength. That's when we become a living representation of what God's story is. I have one last story I want to share with you, um, and that will kind of wrap up our time here. I want to share with you the story of Roderick. He's a little boy from Uganda. Um, Some of you may have heard of him before. Uganda has a lot of witch doctors. It is very prevalent within their society and within their culture. This is a little bit of a hard story to hear. I'm just going to warn you up front. It's, it can be a little rough. Um, the witch doctors have this belief that if you're building a house, if you're to sacrifice a young boy by cutting off his private parts and burying them in the foundation of that home, that that home will be blessed. And Roderick was a victim of one of these sacrifices. But he survived. He lived. He was the first boy to have lived through this. And there's an American over there by the name of Bob Goff who does a lot of things in Uganda, and he is an entire another story of successes and failures. But because Roderick survived, he was able to prosecute the first witch doctor in Uganda. Took him to trial, convicted him, went to prison. Um, part of the other story that really isn't relevant to this is Bob did study with this guy. He became a Christian, preached in prison before he was executed. That's a, a side story. But the story of Roderick, he basically has no family at this point. So Bob adopts him. He is now one of Bob's kids. And Bob travels all over the place, and some doctors heard about what had happened to Roderick. And they came to Bob, and they told him, we can get back to Roderick what was taken. And before he knows it, two weeks later, he is flying across the ocean, and he's undergoing a surgery, and he was given back what was taken from him. Our president, Obama, hears about this. Two weeks after the surgery, guess where he is? He's sitting in the Oval Office meeting the president of the United States, this little boy from Uganda. Bob has a tradition within his family that when you turn 10, you get an adventure. And Roderick is one of his sons now. So Roderick and him are talking, and Roderick decides that he wants to go on an adventure, and he wants to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Bob is not an outdoors person, so they go, and they fly there, and they're pulling the tags off of their hats and their clothes, and they are on their way to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. This is a 10-year-old boy from Uganda is on this grand adventure. Here's a picture of Mount Kilimanjaro. It is 20,000 feet tall. That is about 70 miles high. So it is a very, very tall mountain. Bob describes it, this experience of climbing Kilimanjaro. He said, you start in a ditch that's below sea level, and on the first day, you climb to about 8,000 feet. And then you climb back down to 6,000 feet to stay the night. Second day looks pretty similar. You climb up to 10,000 feet, and you hike back down to 8,000 feet to stay the night. The third day, you're getting the idea. 12,000 feet back down to 10,000 feet. And this may seem a little silly to us, doesn't it? Because it's only 20,000 feet up there. I mean, planes, they're cruising altitude, 30 to 40,000 feet, no sweat. So why can't you just take a helicopter and fly to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro? Well, you can, believe it or not. But you won't enjoy the experience. You will be up there, and you will be miserable because of altitude sickness. You will be puking your guts out. Um, And that's just how it works. I think there's something for us to learn in this, though. If we want to go and look at the top of a mountain experience, if we want to go and we want to stay and we want to spend time, it is going to be a journey like this because that's physically how it works with altitude. I want to ask you, does this graph remind you of your spiritual life at all? I know it does for me. You go up, you get knocked back down. You go up, you get knocked back down. You go up, you get knocked down. And you know what? God has a purpose and God has a plan in that. He's not preparing you to go and look. 
God is preparing you to go and stay. God is preparing you for heaven through this process, through our successes that turn into failures, that turn into successes, that turn into failures. All of that is a part of God's plan within your life. So the question you have to ask yourself is, do you want to go and look, or do you want to go and stay? Roderick doesn't make it to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. He makes it to 14,500 feet, and that's as far as he makes it at age 10. That's amazing. And one night, him and Bob are sitting in the tent on the side of the mountain, and they're having a conversation. And you know what Bob didn't say to Roderick? He didn't say, Roderick, look at how far you have left to go. Suck it up. You can do it. That's not the conversation that Bob has with Roderick. He says to Roderick, look at how far you've come. You have made it this far. And Roderick did not go off that mountain a failure. He did not survive being a child sacrifice to be a failure. Bob does this weird thing where he carries medals around with him and he awards them to people. It's just one of the bizarre things that this guy does. So he said he took all of the medals that he had and he sticks them all over Roderick and awards him an honorary mountaineer. And he said he left that mountain a champion. Someone who had overcome and he could look back and see how far he had come because God was preparing him for a greater journey. There's definitely something for us in that. I want to finish the story of Kilimanjaro for you. The last day of climbing Kilimanjaro when you summit, it takes 31 hours of hiking. The temperatures are negative 15. A lot of people ask Bob, what was the view like from Kilimanjaro? And he said, you know what? I couldn't tell you. Because all I was doing was looking at my guide's boots as I was climbing this mountain. He said, I was tripping and falling every third step and bumping into this guy. And he said, while I followed this guy for this 70 miles, he didn't take one misstep, he didn't trip, he didn't stumble. And you know what else he didn't do? He didn't get annoyed at Bob for bumping into him constantly. He just knew that Bob was following him closely. There's definitely something for us in that. When we have a perfect guide, the path that we're on doesn't matter. Because what's the worst that's going to happen when you trip and stumble and fall? You're going to bump into Jesus. When you fall, you are going to fall into the loving arms of Christ. That's not bad at all. God is going to say, oh, that's just Sally. She just can't keep her balance without me. She's just following me closely. And that's what God thinks when we follow Christ closely. So I want to leave you with a couple thoughts. When you have a perfect guide, the path doesn't matter. And we do have the perfect guide guide. Our perfect guide is Jesus Christ. Hebrews puts it this way. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I don't know what path you're on. I don't know what failure you're facing. But I do know this. You have the perfect guide to follow. And when you trip, and when you stumble, and when you fail you're going to fall into the loving arms of Jesus. So whatever your need is today, come and we'll try and meet that need as we stand and as we sing.